only person who might show up could be Jean Marie, but we did say we we're going to start at yeah, six. And Karen's got uh, she's got her budget presentation to get to in about a half hour, so we're going to okay. move approval of the minutes. Intercenses um, way of monitoring uh, demographic data. And they put out an incredible amount of information based on household surveys. And that's really what we're going to go through today. And again, there tends to be a lot of variation in the intercensal year. So you can look at the ACS data and you can see it like it, it flip flops a little from year to year. Um, part of that what's going on is there, the ACS is actually a five-year running average. So I may say something is 2016 data, but it's really a, a running average of 2012 to 2016. Again, more information than you probably want, but just to, you know, so you know that's what's going on here, and that's why sometimes you see a little bit of variation because it's smoothing out some of the curves. How, how is it viewed by the state, the, the, the data? It's the, it's, it is universally the best, the most comprehensive tool that's out there, okay. you know, across the country. Right. Um, again, just because it's the best doesn't mean it's always right. I think it's pretty good, but um, that's why you guys who probably are, um, you know, no information. I have a sense of what what is happening in your community. So there's there's um, it's good to question things, and it's good for us to have to look and make sure does this make sense. So with that, um, let's just really start um, something that everybody really knows. We we've, we've grown a lot. Um, we're at twenty thousand twenty three right now. Um, you can see there are decades where we practically doubled the population. Um, and, you know, it's just, we're on a fairly um, interesting trajectory with population growth. Um, we have added more people in, I think we've said this a couple of times, between 2010 and 2016, more people than any other uh, community in the state. Yep, and I think I just wanted to say, um, we're not the only fast-growing town, so Gorham and Wyndham are right there with us. Um, we just edged them out by a couple of people. Um, so the yeah. rate, I think, sort of what you'll hear sometimes in the news is Gorham and Wyndham are the fastest growing communities yeah, by rate on their end. So, well, I, but we I have just want to make sure that when we talk about the others, is it a percentage? The growth is a percentage of where they started. They, they, they increased by X percent as opposed to hard numbers. So that's well, for Gorham and Wyndham, it's really both. So they, Gorham and Wyndham edged us out just a tiny bit with percentage increase, but they're just a little bit below where we are in terms of total numbers of people. Okay. So these, you know, those three communities are um, really neck and neck, uh, as, as well as Falmouth. Falmouth is another rapidly uh, that, growing that's community. Falmouth always looked as if it was a percentage increase because the 
actual numbers are pretty small. Not small, but they're, small. They're probably 900 now, I think. Yeah, that's, that's I what think, yeah. but don't 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 quote me. I, I should never I should never say things from memory. <laughs> but just just want to put everything in perspective. We may be adding a lot of people compared to other communities. But Scarborough is only 2% of the state, so I just want us to shrink us back down in terms of uh, perspective. So Cumberland County is about 22%, and what you see is the balance of Cumberland County plus Scarborough. Um, so again, just looking at percents, make sure we don't get our head, get too, too big of a head. <laughs> so this is just trying to show you that the rates can be very volatile from decade to decade. And this is just another way of looking at it. Um, and I wanted to do, actually, I think you can see it. I'm afraid the machine is um, enlarging it a little past what the screen is. But um, down below are the uh, percentage rates. But these are the actual numbers for the town of Scarborough. Population increases by decade. So you can see, like, 1990 to 2000, that was a really big increase. And I know that you guys around the table probably could feel it um, in terms of the amount of, of growth that was there. The number of hours we spent in the planning. Sure, sure. Absolutely. And so 2010, it moderated a little bit in terms of the actual numbers. In 2016, you know, we're, again, less than what we've done in other decades, but still pretty good for a uh, main town and pretty good for... Um, having come through a recession, if you will. And so the reason I have this chart up here <coughs> is um, this is representing the actual uh, uh, increases, growth in the state of Maine. So the data that you were looking at just before this was 2016. Only the state of Maine's data is out for 2017. And I want you to look in 2017, the growth from 2016 to 2017 in terms of population growth is like double. It's a huge increase and you have to anticipate when we get our 2017 numbers, there's nothing that tells me that we wouldn't uh, be seeing a fairly substantial increase from 2016 to 2017. Um, just, just give you some demographics in terms of characteristics. Um, I like this because I you, know, you sort of talk about the, the uh, kids and the seniors. And so here, under 18, right now in 2016, we're about 22% of the total Scarborough population. 65 and older is about 19%. Um, median age is 45. You can see that's a fairly significant increase in the median age for the town. Uh, I think Tom likes to say that we're, we're the oldest uh, community, but we're not. There's a, a lot of communities within Cumberland County that are struggling with um, this particular uh, age group. And then just to track it, because we want to you know, understand what's going on with the seniors. So um, in 2000, we we're 65 and older, about 2,000, I'm sorry, about 13% of the population. 2010, we we're 19%. So we've added, what? Yeah, two 2010s up there. Oh, darn it. So is that 2016? Um, yes, thank you very much. So 2016, yes. we're at 19.3. So it's a draft. <laughs> Good. How about you remember that? Exactly, exactly. Is, is that graph in here? Um, that graph is so. not in here. I pulled no, back. I didn't see it. Yeah. I think this is what we The numbers are in there, but the numbers yeah, graph. Exactly. And then down at the bottom, you can sort of see, I wanted to look at, we used to call 85 plus the frail elderly, but I just don't think that term is appropriate anymore. Um, I think people are healthier longer, um, but the percentage of population 85 plus, 1.3% in 2000, 2.5% in um, 2015. All right, again, I'm sorry I'm rushing, but um, I want to give you guys time to ask some questions. So one thing that I think is really important for us to understand as we're looking at the, you know, the future is talking about, all right, well, what types of households are actually in um, the community? And we just equate with the household 
is the same thing as an occupied unit as far as the census is concerned. So that's all it's talking about. And the household refers to all the folks in that particular household. So what we have is, oh, maybe it surprises uh, people, 25% of our households in 2016 are one-person households. Yeah. 6% uh, are, they call them non-family households, but it's just unrelated people living in the same household. You've got another, uh, essentially a third of family households with children under 18. And then the balance of the households are family households. So there are kids, and there may be kids living at home that are older than 18, or older than 17. How many data on whether that one person household, 25% is male or female? I think we do have some of that. And I can't remember whether it's in one of the data charts, but I do know I, I can pull that info. Yeah, there's some info on that. Good. How do, you, how do you handle places like Atria and Piper Shores and data lands? Um, it depends on, on how, how, what types of units there are. Atria is going to be um, considered a, a group quarters because they're, half of them at least are not individual um, yeah. units. But some of them that are the apartments, mm -hmm. the Census Bureau um, would treat that as an apartment, as a rental unit. Okay. But it does depend on to the reporting person, because remember, all this is self-reported. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So I think there's a little bit of blending that goes in there, but technically, if it's an independent unit with its own kitchen and bathroom, and you know, it should be counted as part of this. Okay. Now, income. I just wanted to um, uh, show us. It's always good to understand where we stand. Uh, so you've got Cumberland County at $61,000, $62,000 for their uh, median household income. You've got Scarborough, certainly above that. Um, we are fifth, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, yes, fifth. <laughs> I have to count the little discs. We are fifth in terms of overall um, income within Cumberland County. So Cumberland, Cape Elizabeth, Falmouth, uh, North Yarmouth, um, interesting enough, those all have um, higher median household incomes. Interestingly enough, when I pulled the data, I think I pulled, because sometimes there can be a difference between household income and family income and per capita income, um, and we rank fifth in all of those, no matter where you went. The top communities changed a little bit, like Falmouth and Cape Elizabeth and sometimes Yarmouth got in there. Those all you know, um, changed around a little bit, but we are a solid five, uh, no matter what we do. Uh, but the one interesting thing about the income from the 2016 data is that for the first time, we really saw the household uh, income start to rise a little bit. In the, according to the American Community Survey, if you looked from 2010 to 2016, there were up a little, down a little, up a little, up, down a little. So for 2016 is the first time that you see, you know, at least a noticeable increase in the income. And it happened really, you know, in, in most of the coastal towns as well. Um, and similarly, when I pulled wage data, for the first time the wage data showed an uptick. So that's good. And this because I just really wanted to use an iPhone uh, image. I had it. I had to use it. So we're talking about mobility. And yes, has the mobile iPhone has nothing to do with these this data. But it's cheap. Yeah, you know. Um, so the geographic mobility, with which the census is calling, the length of time at, current, at your current residence. And I think for Scarborough, we have a really interesting profile. So 5%, this is 2016, 5% of our households have been in that household for a year or less. 29% have been six years or less. So 29% of households are new to 2000, from 2010. And that's residents, not town resident, right? So if you lived in... That's it's Scarborough. 
Yeah. Are you, was it, are you talking about how long, you've been, how long someone's been in Scarborough or how long they've been in their house? The, the only definition is in their house. Okay. So there's, there are probably a few folks who, there's a, a, a sliver of that that probably is people moving from home to home. All right, so 29% minus one household. <laughs> but there will, be, there, there will be others. I've um, seen that as my neighborhood has changed, and uh, there are a lot that are, they stay five, six, or seven years, and then they, they move because it's a different kind of housing. It's smaller. It's not starter homes. It's, it's, it's starter, starter homes. homes. And right now, we've got several starter homes that have been either renovated or sold. Uh -huh. and three, three on Maple Avenue. I get what you're going for here. 
Yeah. Just, you know, this is like the, the gut check of what's really happening in the community. Mm -hmm. This is not the median price of all homes. Just those homes. It's only oh, those that sold. In 2017. But if, but if you think of some of the developments that have gone in, there's been some high-end stuff yep. that's gone in oh, in yeah. that time frame. Almost so almost that, that may not be that far off. Yeah. I don't think it is that far off. I just want to make sure that we're talking about within the, within the year 2017. Or yep. Correct. Okay. Correct. That was for the whole the whole year, and I believe the first quarter, in the first quarter, first two months again, going from memory, so uh, was a little bit more. Exactly, it is. Uh, it is a little bit higher than that. Um, I think it was like 402 or something like that. So we, you know, we we certainly have high end housing. And what does this have to do with affordable housing? Yeah. It's not. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk a little bit about jobs. And the first thing I want you to know is there are, there are several different sources of job data. And they can all look very different. Um, so I'm going to dissect this for you. Um, this, two stats up here, three if you consider the total. The first thing, the wage and salary jobs, that's reported by the um, Department of Labor. Those jobs represent um, employment in companies that are covered by unemployment insurance. Which in means, Scarborough. yes, correct, in Scarborough. Uh, but the entire data set, you know, mm -hmm. for the state of Maine, it's sometimes called wage and salary, sometimes it's called covered employment, and that relates to whether or not uh, there's unemployment insurance pay. So what that means is if you're self-employed or like a lot of the hair salons, those are like independent stations. So the hair salon, uh, the person who runs the booth, yeah, may not be uh, an employee of the firm, they're renting a booth. So those types of jobs are not included in wage and salary. And so we make a little bit of a, an estimate. So I'm gonna say the self-employed contract, that's, that's my estimate. And I do it based on a percentage of, you know, some national data. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some other employment data that gives me a sense of, you know, I don't think we're too far off. Um, and this is something that just to give you a flavor, so in terms of the number of jobs to residents, we're almost at a one-to-one -one basis in terms of employees, jobs in Scarborough versus people. Um, and then between 2000, 10 in 2016, we've added 140 net new wage and salary establishments. And establishments just means it's a, it's a, it's located, yeah, it's, and it's located in, in Scarborough. But like Hanford is a firm that has establishments all over. So sometimes they distinguish between firms and establishments. But these are unique to Scarborough, 140. Um, I hesitate to use the word company because a company could have more than two locations, uh, but the, their physical addresses, so to speak. It would be interesting to see the ratio against people who are 16 plus or sure. more than age. You know? Yeah. And I'll let you know, like Portland um, has, being the central hub that it is, has always had more employees than people living in town. And so that presents some interesting dynamics, uh, too. But I think you know one of the, the interesting challenges as we look at uh, the economic development pieces is trying to understand, well, how many folks are living and working in the same community? Because that's a great opportunity for folks, and you know cuts down the commute, and you know so we we do have some of that. I think is in your uh, packet. If you, if you could stand to read through it, you could find it. Um, uh, and so, just want to talk about our largest employment sectors. Healthcare is growing and increasing in its um, number of, numbers of employees. Um, it's about 21% of Scarborough's total um, employment now. Retail is 16.5%, decreasing. Whereas healthcare is increasing in dollars. Decreasing by percentage. 
my percentage. I think the numbers were still, yeah. if I remember, they're increasing, very close. They're yeah. increasing slightly, right. but their percentage of. Exactly. And the, the, the interesting you know, piece for retail for us to, to think about, too, is um, if you compare employment to square footage of retail, you're going to see a pretty big jump in square footage of retail, but no real increase in employment. And that's because the retail is more efficient, more, um, you know, fewer employees serving um, a, a larger amount of square footage, fewer employees per square feet. Um, and the <laughs> other piece to these two industries, too, is remember retail, well, very wonderful jobs. They do tend to be low pay, lower paying than other sectors. Healthcare tends to be a little bit higher um, paying. So you do have a, um, a, you know, a reasonably chunk of the economy that is on the lower side of the wage scale. And in terms of sort of um, uh, any service industry, like restaurant or mm -hmm. lodging, are any of those included in retail numbers? They're, they're, are those they're hopefully isolated. There's yeah. a restaurant, um, you know, there's a, a separate category for those. Mm -hmm. And if you asked about um, uh, restaurant and lodging yeah. is how it's usually ca uh, categorized, that's about 7 to 8% of our employment. Again, that's going to spike during the summer. So it depends if you're looking at third quarter numbers or if you're looking at um, annual. These are average annual numbers. And then I did want to talk a little bit about entre entrepreneurship because this is, I think, setting up some of where um, I think the SEDCO board is interested in uh, going um, and talking about uh, how do we begin to capture some of the uh, entrepreneurial activity that's going on here? So this is these are some numbers that I you know, I pulled from a, a new source. There's a um, uh, a some some uh, research institutes that are really looking at entrepreneurship, and one of the things they're saying is, okay, so 8.3 percent of your population they're business owners. So theoretically, 8 percent of, of our adult population has its own business. They're not all in Scarborough. So for us, is there an opportunity to sort of isolate who the business owners are who live in Scarborough but are not nece don't necessarily have their business here? It's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. There's a potential, and this one I find this is this is challenging my perceptions that there's uh, from this one uh, source of info, they're saying there's a potential of, in Scarborough alone, 33 new firms a month. All by Scarborough people. Yeah. So part of it is, like, uh, these numbers were done by um, main entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship numbers. Um, again, I, 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 I'm presenting it, and I'm like, it's challenging my, my sense. But you know what? Even if it's a tenth of that, that's a lot of entrepreneurship activity that we as SETCO should be looking at and saying, how can I um, help and nurture this new business formation? And what are the types of things that we can really do to focus on a startup? And one of the other stats that really, I think, got me was if a firm, a new firm, survives five years, they have a 68% average growth rate over that five-year period. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, they're probably micro firms, and they're going from one to three people or something like that, but that's still very important. Um, and it's homegrown, and um, we, we need to figure out how we can um, find them, nurture them, and um, you know, help them grow. Uh, and we like said that 28.6% of businesses are women-owned, according to, this is from the economic census, so that's a 2012 number. And this is where this 2,264, that's from the economic census. Um, that's an extrapolation of the 2012 number to 2016. This is the number of businesses that they said are out there. They don't have employees. So some of those are these new businesses that are forming. Some of them are, 
everybody knows somebody who created a business in their, you know, uh, as, a, as a side gig, um, and it, they run them. And then some businesses create multiple Honey. firms. <laughs> Honey. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but again, I think what we're what we're seeing here is um, there's a rich uh, entrepreneurial behavior that's going on in Maine and in Scarborough theoretically, and we need to figure out how to, to capture and work with those folks. Um, and you know, I think that's just a um, a, a, a rich opportunity for us. Um, so that's really the entrepreneurship piece. And then, I, yeah. I still, I, I, I brought this in. This is something we talked about from, um, you know, really when we were looking at the uh, uh, Scarborough Downs and the Crossroads folks. Uh, it's their, that terminology that they're using, which is, we're not really quite suburban. We're not quite urban. We're bringing up this. You're, we're growing both our, our uh, population and our um, employment, and you know I think that's some of the trends that we're seeing is how do we um, keep all the great things about the residential part of our community, um, but grow our um, economy in ways that are compatible with the town and compatible with the employment and skills here, and um, I think there's some interesting opportunities to do that and I'm going to stop because now it's 6.30 uh, and do not want to make the finance committee mad as they're going through my budget um, but there's more there's a lot more info in here um, one of the things that I would point out that uh, I thought was interesting is we talk about traffic a lot but when they looked at commute times it was almost the same matter of fact it decreased by just a little tiny bit um, I thought some of the some of the commute information was, was kind of counterintuitive. Yeah. The, the commuting data. Yeah, the commuting yeah. data, both the, the volume and some of the, the directions. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. I know we don't have a lot of time. But yeah. One question. Yeah. Having read down through all of the data, the thing that it left me with was, so what are we supposed to do with this as part of this process? Yeah. What, what's the next step for this piece right. Right. that we need to be focusing on or coming up with some form of recommendations? Well, I'm going to speak to the economy piece. Um, so there's, a, there's several things in here that are relevant to looking at um, how we go about uh, growing our economy over the next 10 years. One is um, making sure we're taking advantage of the health care and the opportunities there. Um, making sure that we are targeting um, in a market that makes sense. Um, we get some of this data, we get some of that from here. Um, it's reaching out on this entrepreneurship piece and part of that is land use related. I'm going to say that we come back to um, really looking at how we treat home occupations. And I think um, Brian uh, Longstaff and I have been talking about can we make it simpler? Are there ways to um, ease the home occupation uh, criteria? That may not be the right word, but ease the uh, what seems like some of the red tape to get more of uh, home occupations to register, number one, so that we know about them and we can help them. Um, but looking at, are we creating any excess burdens there? I don't know that we are, but um, I'm going to tell you that sometimes we have questions where it's like, I don't really fit neatly um, into the home occupation piece. You're really a separate business than your home. And so there's a, there's a lot of things that we need to, to look at as a companion. For affordable housing, I think what we're, just, what we're just saying is the pricing continues to grow, continues to increase. And that's really for us to analyze um, what does this mean for our policy with affordable housing? How can we um, create more opportunity in the market? Or do we need to do other types of intervention? Yeah. How do we do I'll, that I'll without just, killing off exactly. the people that are 85 or 65? I guess what I sort of say is part of the comp plan is taking a snapshot of who are we. You know, yeah. and, 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 sort of, and this is a lot of what's here. Yeah. Is, and, are 
the trends that we've been seeing continuing? Okay, they are. You can't, you don't know what the future is necessarily going to hold, but it certainly helped inform that. So, like that's that's a lot of what this is about. Um, I think in terms of sort of our land use recommendations and the, the other works, how this gets folded in, in you know, like our certainly it's going to help inform the other components, but this is a lot of just sort of that informational basic. Here's who we are as yeah. a community. Okay. So, so knowing what the price is of houses that are being built right now is something that you really need to know, especially if you're concerned about low income, I mean, right. affordable housing. Geez, it's not as bad as we think it is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> There's also that it was, it was referenced at one of the meetings fairly recently, the question of, you know, is the rapid growth something that should be a point of pride and something that we should that, is, that the town should continue, should try to encourage, or is it something that we need to, is a potential red flag that we... And that's the kind of discussion that we will do, you know, in terms yeah. of actually forming yeah. the plan. Absolutely. Yep. This is just information. But it's that's also true. interesting to think back about what we thought in the previous plan, yeah, isn't that yeah. because both those points where we wanted to control growth, yeah. and we also wanted to increase affordable housing. So it's interesting, did we did succeed in either of those? That's from a good the, question, from the early. Right. Right now. Yeah. yeah, so I think there's a, you know, there's a lot of, uh, um, you know, different aspects, and I guess part of what you're going to do is think back, as you're looking at the policy, does that match what we know the community tool got? Uh, and are we missing, are we missing a piece? And I think one of the things that, that probably, um, you know, certainly, we fill in the planning department is, you know, we've used up a lot of the easily, easily developable land. So, what's the next step? A lot of the land that needs to be developed is going to have some environmental constraints. And that's a good thing because that's where it should be. But it, you know, you, you may not see the types of growth rates we've had before um, in, a, in a different mode or a different style of development. Right. Okay. You have to go. I noticed you have a few sources in here, but do you could share any Absolutely. other uh, links that you use? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you, guys. Well, thank you. Good luck. You can watch it all. I tried. I tried my best. <laughs> so we can certainly keep, you know, you know, parents leaving, but if there's additional questions, we can keep talking about the community profile or the other component that we have is the built environment that our consultants have I put together. It's going to become really useful when mm -hmm. we start actually coming up with, well, you know, if you would like this to happen, but do we, put, do we have the um, information that to support what it is we want to do? Right. So what is the data telling us? What is the data of? telling us right now? Mm -hmm. Are we happy with the community profile discussion? This point? Discussion, yeah. Profile? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. It's accurate. Well, that's, that's the idea. <laughs> Use the best data we have. Um, so part of part of the, the work that you also were asked to look at was the built environment section that the um, folks from TPUDC have been have put together for our consideration, so... Um, May I ask a question? About please this? do, yes. Um, as I read through it, fascinating stuff. Our job right now is to see whether or not we agree with what they say they see. We're not going to try to figure out how to resolve questions or no, no. identify potential right. changes. I mean, this is just to take a look and say, yeah, that's how I experience eight corners, and yes, that's how I experience Dunstan. We're not looking to say, yeah, but we did this. Right, we're not, we're not answering it. We're I mean, we're, we've got, there's a lot, yeah. there's a lot of pieces. So we're, we're, fell into that last right, time. so we're taking, we're taking small bites of this. And so, so yeah, I mean, the questions are, are the type of reflections that are being in here, are they, are they what the community experiences? Are we, are we sort of off, where are we off base? Where are we right on track? Are there any areas that we need to flesh out further? So, um, I mean, this is why we, you know, we, we took, undertook the process. We, last time we 
sort of did get into starting to talk about how to resolve. How to resolve, right? And, and that's, that'll come as good. That, that all will come. Just want to make sure that's right. Yep. The so. interesting thing, at looking at the printed copy, mm -hmm. it's not the same as the copy that I was getting on my iPad because there were sections that were really blown up, and it kind of made me wonder if there was something in there we were supposed to be specifically discussing. I don't know if anybody it wasn't that, screen fit. But, yeah. You needed to adjust the yeah, that's but why I, mean, I like, like, the that's font. Why I like yeah. copy. The, the font would, would go berserk yeah. on it. Yeah, well, you know, you're reading like a 10 or 11 no font, and all of a sudden it's like. 16. Huh. And yeah, then it dropped yeah. back down to a smaller font again. And it was like, yeah. are you trying to highlight something? Or? It's yeah. just, yeah. It's just it makes me believe it more so. No more technology for me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So I think, I mean, when I was reading through here, clearly they still sort of had some little commentary that sort, sort of said, insert illustrations here, or mm -hmm. refer to another section yeah. there. So I, to me, when I was sort of reading through it, that's what I, what I was seeing in those jumps was less about areas they were trying to highlight, but... Um, I like the concept on page two, I think, is the start that I began citing to see it, that yep. looking at the what they're calling community activity centers. Page two at the top. Going to ask you, what are they defining a community and regional activity center? Well, it, it comes from the yeah, previous page identifying, you know, there's eight corners in Dunstan and Oakville, yep. those are the centrally located villages. And then we have um, the, down, the downtown of Oak Hill. And I'm assuming that the process of Dunstan and Oak Hill would be categorized as community activity centers. And I'm not saying I disagree, I think it's true, but it, I just think that's a, 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 that is a term that we should start using on a regular basis. That's one of our community activities. Right, yeah, and I think, as you just said, that's what they were sort of reclassifying Oak Hill, Dunstan, and the Downs. Uh, not not to be confused with what we call in the zoning with TBC. Right. 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 And so the comp plan is different from the. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah this is going to build to our growth. Um, our growth uh, in conservation <coughs> map. You know, that's sort of what, what these are going to grow out of. So. Then we get down to the next paragraph where they're saying Scarborough Downs has the potential to be redeveloped at a higher intensity than the community activity centers that's been categorized as a regional activity center. Now, categorized by these folks, by our consultants, yes? So, bring me to where you are again. I'm on page two. Yeah, that's a good question. The way that's worded almost suggests that it's some kind of a official. Well, that's why I bring it up. I'm not yeah, too sure what we do with it as a committee. It's under a character and context, or under, under, last plan, under the plan of the loser process, okay, it also recognizes yeah. 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 And at the bottom of it says, at the bottom of that paragraph, it says the potential to be redeveloped at a higher intensity than the community activity centers have been categorized as a regional activity center. And maybe, it, maybe it needs so. to be have you know, that kind of a concern given to it, but I'm not saying I disagree. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure out what we do in terms of So it has the potential to become a regional activity center. But then it's been categorized as a regional right. activity. I think that is that's a good a general editorial comment, maybe that there, there should probably be extra scrutiny of some of these, some of the terminology uh, yeah. against what appears in our ordinances mm -hmm. to try to avoid any confusion. Right. <coughs> I think they're just referring to density. It sounds to me like they're just being descriptive. Right, but when you, when you uh, capitalize yeah. it, regional activity center. Right? And I, I believe that's the term they used. So in the, if you remember, I think one of the first chapters we looked at was that plan format chapter that mm -hmm. had sort of the, had the start of the growth and conservation map. And <coughs> you know, they start to call out the hamlets. I think that, that this is the terminology that they used in the growth and uh, uh, conservation Okay. But I'll, I'll confirm that I thought I had that here. But that's also part of the problem with reading this thing disjointedly we're like we're doing. You're only like kind of looking at one part of the elephant at a time. Right. So, right. To, right. so, I mean, it is going to be a much more integrated plane. So hopefully this will all, but that's a, that's a 
good point to bring up. We want to be sure that that's, <laughs> that these things are and making you've been, sense. You've been looking at a lot of things that we haven't seen. Um, so you've seen that chapter, the plain right. form, but we have seen other chapters, right? So I mean, there could be some references being made. But I think not. your your point is right on. So I did have actually just in the next sentence, they sort of talk about understanding yes. uh, the character of Scarborough's village, hamlets, and neighborhoods. Well, we've defined hamlets, but we haven't yet defined neighborhoods. So I said, well, what? That was my sort of comment. Was yeah. we got to be sure where? What do we mean by the neighborhoods? Are we now talking about? Because we have defined a set of hamlets. Yeah. So, yeah. That's yeah. Yeah, I think <coughs> when you think back historically, and I have to refer to the area that I live in, the Green Acres area. Mm -hmm. I, it's not titled anywhere. Right. But it was the first major development. Plan. In 1923, I have the map of it. A proposal for development. Right. So and to me, that that sort of a neighborhood. That's it's the not defined family as we've yeah, sort of thought. There's not space but, for you know, right. well, coordinated it's activity it's going to be anymore because of the latent. And so you know, we, we used up. But it, it, it certainly is a neighborhood. I like the idea of this form under character and context. Yeah, that was a question I had, because um, that seems to be their, their, to me as I read through this, that was the silver bullet. That was the answer to all ills. That was the way I read it, was, okay, that's one tool in the mm -hmm. toolbox, what, where are the others? Yeah. Um, so that was one of the comments I had written down. last sentence is pretty... Most effective means. Exactly. In some places, in some cases, it's for, for for a variety of sites, but not, 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 in, general. General. not and, in general. And it seemed, you know, it, it, we sort of talked about, at least internally anyway, some of our zoning, at least one on one, like the TVCs, were sort of this hybrid form based zoning as it is. We, we already bring buildings closer and put parking behind, but that's. I don't know that those are the biggest nuts we have to crack. It's, I mean, that's certainly part of it, but we already have design standards, and maybe we need to refine those. The other, but um, again, it just seemed like that's a piece to the issues. But I think you know some of the bigger contextual issues that I feel like we have with our built environment is the fact that these activity centers, as we just sort of talked about them, the Downs, Dunstan, and Oak Hill, are our Historic, or at least Oak Hill and Dunstan are sort of our villages, and Dunstan uh, Downs has been identified for a growth area. Well, they all sit on impaired or threatened watersheds. Right. So, you know, we have this balance of we want to direct growth to these areas because that's where we have infrastructure that can, you know, potentially support density. But we do have these environmental conflicts. But if we run away from those areas, we could just be creating other impaired <laughs> watersheds. So I was, I'm sort of hoping that these guys can help us crack that nut a little bit more than just design. But I think you know, we, we were talking character-based as we were comparing Higgins and Pine Point. Mm -hmm. They have the same nature as far as you know the, the people that they serve, but how we're going to approach. It does. It does say in this character and context mm. part that just before the um, up, up a couple of lines, it says third step is creating the mock standards. Yes, design and architectural guidelines. Yes. Mm -hmm. And an example of this approach is the form-based code. It's an example of that approach. Mm -hmm. There are other examples, and I think the best way we start. But the next sentence to seems to go. Seems to really double down. Kind of and they said that's the yeah. it, and they reference there's there's, an example. there's another area back here where they reference form based character based yeah. zoning as the answer. It's like well okay yep yeah, again there is are there more and and not to say again no, perfectly I, I, good tool. I, I think we're all but, on, mm -hmm. on yeah. One thing that one thing that kind of jumped out to me mm -hmm. on this and, and it's understandable at one level in a, in a sense given that this is talking about the built environment and most of the built environment is in these villages, as we refer to them. But by 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 area, the majority of the town is more kind of suburban and rural. Yep. And I know, again, this might also be a function of the fact that we're kind of looking at this section in isolation. But 
I guess I'd like to see some, whether it's here or elsewhere, make sure that, that there's some recognition and consideration of the rest of the town and, and thinking about these things there as well. Because um, I think sometimes there's a tendency that, again, understandably to an extent, focus on the coastal areas and the Route 1 corridor and these village nodes. And then, yeah, then there's North Scarborough, West Scarborough, and kind of the rest of the town. And that's a lot of the town. Maybe not population-wise, although there are a lot of people who live out. It could mm -hmm. be where the both Yeah, occurs. so I, I think that's a big, especially if we're thinking about <coughs> planning, um, looking at this in the longer term, I just want to make sure that we're that's not getting short sure trip. Right. Right. And actually I think one of the notes I sort of drafted was, you know, most the residents of the town sort of identify with the town with where you where you live. Most of you don't live in Dunstan or Oak Hill. You know, it's in the Green Acres type neighborhood or mm -hmm. you know, Hill. Or it's, you know, I live out broad term. Right. That's 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 right. yeah. what well, so you, yeah. you experience the centers. But, what we've promoted in the last 10 years is growth versus non-growth. All that mm -hmm. depth, and you say that they're all three unpaired waterways. Mm -hmm. that, I think that's, that, I don't remember us really weighing the environmental consequences right. of pushing growth down the Route 1 corridor. We didn't think about it. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> that's definitely very important. I mean, I mean at, at, you know, frankly, I think that's my hope with this comp plan is that, again, we sort of talked about we need to start to weave all these factors together is if we're going to direct growth to these areas and there might be you know a host of good reasons to do that we need to at least recognize the challenges and protect how do we what are what are the methodologies what are the tools to, to deal with those yeah, automatically what you're talking about now because you're talking about yep. making connections with nature of the built environment, but it doesn't it doesn't address what you just what you just discussed has to be more um, right in your face if you look in the, in the front and what it says here at the very end of that paragraph is that the town should work to preserve these important connections to nature while finding new ways to connect people with that, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But nowhere in there does it say anything about the natural resources having an impact, having like, that growth in our growth areas has an impact on natural resources. And that is not in Yep. And I also think it's important to highlight the importance of, um, to highlight the value of the, of, of the watersheds and, and yep. the natural environment in its own right, not purely as a resource for people to enjoy, although not to recreate. that's a big part of it. And it's understandable and it makes sense to, to kind of make sure that there's a constituency for it. But I hate to see it considered only to the extent that people can go kayaking or or have a view. I mean, the view thing in Scarborough, as we know, can become a hot button issue. Um, and I just, yeah, I think it's important to think about the, you know, the streams themselves or the, the environment itself. Before we move on from natural resources, I would like to put in a plug for scenic views. I mean, with the previous comp plan, we spent a lot of time. We got on a bus. Anybody here, Judy, maybe you were with us. We got on the bus and we looked at the view corridors. Yeah. It was a big deal for us. And as far as we can see, it didn't make it into the No. So I would like to make a big deal about the fact that we do need to identify what those, what those uh, scenic views were. And I think that we would have a well, I guess so. That's that's like a uh, question. Would this comp plan actually identify those view corridors? Because then I think that's a diff. We need to then start an earnest effort of doing. Are you thinking of pulling out what you what was done back? 10, 12 years ago, or, or would this comp plan reference the fact that we should identify our scenic? I, I don't think this plan is going to be where we identify the scenic corridors. I think if we can reference that the, the town should take on the effort and undergo a study to identify the scenic corridors. I would go with the first option. They can make a recommendation that we go through the previous yeah. material. 
to see what they were. Yeah. In other words, let's not deem them real. Yeah. There are going to be some that are going to be useless because we didn't do anything about it and they're all developed and they're gone. Well, and, yeah, I guess to me that does lead to that question. I mean, what, once you identify them, what can you do about it? Because right. they're at a, at a legal level, you, they're, you can debate whether people are entitled to have views and I think we all would agree that these view corridors exist and they're valuable, but from a pragmatic planning perspective, once they've been identified, are we going to, is the town going to, are there going to be moratoriums, are there going to be height limits? I think that, that's the kind of thing we have um, to take a look at, and, and the fact that it's so actually in the comp plan that these are the scenic areas that we have identified is a big deal. Well, and so I guess that's my question is, if we want to take the time to identify the scenic corridors, then I think that's a multi-month sort of no, public not, outreach not. process. Or, or is it just the six or eight of us around the... The comp plan should yeah. include direction to create a right. list. That's what you said. That, that's what I would say. I, well, that's what I wanted to... The list yeah. could be taken from the archives and then checked. We don't have to be in the entire... Right, as part of the process. Right. I, I, because I'm usually, here. you know, yep. I mean, some of them were probably affected yep. by what was going on at the time yeah. that they were identified. And one in particular was Hobby's Parkway. I wholeheartedly disagreed that it was a, it was a, a visual vista, you know, that I, I said, oh, let's go to Hobby's Parkway today. <laughs> you know, no, but but there was a lot going on know. about Hobby's yes. Parkway at that time, so. I think it's, yeah. Okay. So so I was, yeah. Take a look at what they what we did. Oh, and this whole thing about the store of resources going away. It's something that's got to be written into the plan that really empowers the Historic Preservation Implementation Committee. These are these these are a lot of fond of knowledge, but they don't feel empowered. Believe me, I know I've been hanging out there for the past couple of months. I'm working on a particular project that makes them a resource for me. And I'm blown away yeah. by what the historical society has. Yeah, yeah. But those people are the ones that really feed into the historical sort of preservation implementation committee, or certainly could. And that I don't think it works that way. So somehow or another, there's some empowerment mm -hmm. that needs to happen here. And I don't know how you how you do that in terms of bringing people the land. So all kinds of things that not on. List of 48, I think it is, that is in our ordinance. There's, yeah. So, uh, so you're talking about a reference to tying the historic society in with it, because here it references the historic, the uh, preservation implementation committee, which is a town committee, but the historic society is a they're a separate body. It needs to be part of the town. I just oh, think yeah. I circled that one too. Now you say that, yeah. Yeah, I think I circled that one too now, you say that, yeah. 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 I have a big how under the, under the importance of building environment, yeah. and I won't go into it because I know this isn't the way to do it, yeah. but the second part, welcoming town, a welcoming town to start with to provide all residents with our consideration and so on. But this is um, affordable housing. Built environment, including open streets, civic spaces, should also be resilient and able to adapt to changing demographics. That's a big topic to take on. Sounds like any town anywhere. It, it also sounds. I know. For the rest of the obvious here. That's why I love that's that's so what I love it. Someone would have come plan. Sometimes yeah. does. It's yeah. a bit motherhood and apple pie. Yeah. 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 That's one of the things I would like to see not happen. I would, yeah. like, I would like this to not be mm -hmm. apple pie. Mm -hmm.
much in the way you comments. I mean, one, one of the things I've I noticed sort of under walkability, and, and maybe Corey, this circles a little bit back to what you were talking about. I remember during at least maybe some of our, maybe it was neighborhood meetings, maybe it was Plant Blues, I can't remember when, but a lot, oftentimes people talking about having connections between the neighborhoods. Again, you know, not necessarily our hamlets or our villages, you know, but just, uh, I'm on page four okay. under community, neighborhood, and design, oh, walkability. Oh, walkability. Thank you. you know, I think a lot of this is focused around walkability mm -hmm. in sort of those activity centers, but connecting, you know, one sort of rural, suburban subdivision with another one. We have sort of these open spaces that have been created, but now it's about making those connections so you can maybe go. I'd say the most important, um, no, that's not the question, but the very important part of this walkability mm -hmm. is the last few lines under destination where it says most of the town residents don't live with their yep. places. So care should be taken when developing or redeveloping neighborhoods to provide walking amenities so as many residents as possible. In other words, that's a, that's yep. a big thing to make sure it's plain pop, not just walks to the door. And the biking at the end of the next section. No. Biking the same thing. Yeah. yeah. But wouldn't we need to at that point, isn't that an ordinance change that's going to be required because I'm you know, oh, yeah. sitting on the planning board, people sitting on the planning board, how are they going to be able to enforce that this new development needs to be able to connect to the other development? And part of the problem you run into there is that the other development didn't make, didn't make the, the provisions for the connectivity, so now what the hell do you do? Right. You can't go back and ask the residents in the other development to now put in, you know, I mean, it's, yeah. so you can't. I'll give you another example with the Green Acres again, but there was a, a bridge put in, uh, just as you come into Green Acres Road, and it was supposed to connect to a pathway that went to the rear of that parcel and down to, along the river and connected up with another water line. And it's never happened if we have a bridge to nowhere. Yeah. Nobody has ever maintained it or established it, you know, so that it works. Yeah. That's where, yeah, you do get into some of the tension between what people, what people, being used very broadly, what people often say they want in a community and then what they vote for when they yeah. put their, put their wallets in their checkbook when they go to buy a house and they go and buy a house at the end of the cul-de-sac and they don't want people cutting through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, you know, these are, I'm sure there are going to be some more interesting conversations about this. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, with the crossroads right now, we're talking about connectivity there and the Sawyer Road question. Right. And, you know, that's another example. I just hope that when we get to this part, not tonight, when we get to this part, we have a lot of plenty of time for it because it really does have to be. I mean, a big, big deal. But so far in our history, it hasn't been. In terms of connectivity between connectivity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we, the and as, as you know, Susan and me too, on the, on the planning board, when we're when we're talking about side even sidewalks, yeah, not even connectivity, but just having sidewalks in the neighborhood. And the attitude generally <coughs> seems to be the default attitude is, oh, it's not like where are they gonna walk to to right. <coughs> it's not a neighborhood and it's more expensive. So why should we have to do it? Yeah. But so there are areas where it's worked, though. I mean, there are successes in that. I mean, you might think of any better. No, it's, you know, you see the end of the sidewalk, but somewhere down the line, you're going to be like that. I mean, I live in a good example up at Jim Cornell and Cumberland, which was developed in two or three phases. And there was a fire, a fire uh, path that is now a connection to probably three or four gradually larger loops between Maple and Honeywell Hill yeah. and the new neighborhood, which works fabulously for people walking. Mm -hmm. um, lots of people if that, you know, if that was, if it was simply as simple as the easement, mm -hmm. um, let a leftover fire easement to, you know. Mm -hmm. I think it's definitely possible, and, and the time has come to exchange your bond, and they take all of them, and they chew on this. Yeah. And there is value, yeah. 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 again, yeah. That is yeah. from, based on the planning board experience, there is value in having mm -hmm. these principles yeah. in the comp plan, yeah. 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 just at that level, because yeah. applicants, yeah. Uh, developers and other applicants will read it 
and they will say, you know, this is this is consistent with the comp plan, or you know, it gives us it gives us something to it gives us something to kind of hang our hats on. But you can talk about it, but just again going back to you need to have a team, right? So yep. the only way you have a team is you got to put it in the board right? So yep. you got to put team. Otherwise, it's basically negotiated. Yeah. Exactly. But if it's not in the comp plan, then we can't get it into an ordinance. Right. So yeah. know, this is sort of our yeah. first. I guess what I'm saying is that we're going to be checking the definition of what we want to do, mm -hmm. not just, you know, just touching with those mm -hmm. deep in there. It is important that it is expected that yeah. that kind of yeah. language. <coughs> is there a reason why they didn't include bikeability, Jay? Um, no, sort of. Walkability is sort of more important here, remember? Yeah, I don't, I don't know why. Um, yeah, I would think maybe we could even consider this walkability more of an um, uh, alternative mode. You know, Transportation. Right, multimodal or really? alternative mode. They talk about the whole quarter mile thing, which right. they say people aren't going to walk more than a quarter of a mile. The bikeability takes it's a little bit bigger. Right? Yeah. In the in the transportation chapter they talk a bit about bikeability, uh, the ability for bikes. Um, sure. So uh, I guess that's a question if we want to have that as one of the principles for Okay, so are we on the next unit? Wherever you want to go. Well, I don't know. Are we done with the next one? Sure. And back to the next use. Yeah, and I think sort of the connectivity bit does start, that also touches on what we were. This seems to be um, section three. It seems to be sort of taking what they're already doing. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Having it on the back and saying more. The mixed use yeah. piece? Mm -hmm. Those two elements. Yeah. I think that's, we're from where we're right. 
So I think there's it just to be so long. Mm -hmm.
in terms of the yeah. sort of way we're looking at it right now yeah. is the end product. What would they be doing? I mean, it's yeah. a good example of the scale, particularly the rear of the building and the facade that was chosen to, you know, so that it would all go down mm -hmm. uh, anything further. I would be very cautious there. And then that last paragraph on, on page seven is still part of this number five. We're talking about design standards. Mm -hmm. And we have design standards. Yes. Yeah. They're not always used to discriminate by a person who would like to see them, but they're there. Mm -hmm. so we can refer to them and say, oh, too much land, or too much space that doesn't mind you. Yeah, I think parking location, again, is something that's echoed in a lot of our ordinances already and our design standards for sort of minimizing the amount of parking out front. Uh, yeah, I think the one thing that this adds mm -hmm. is it actually says put something in there about smart technologies. So uh, that's something our current, we don't really address that, I don't think, right now in, in parking. We are, as we look to the future, we might need to do more of that. I think using parking as a shared space is, I mean, based on the hours that a particular business might be open. You see some of it happening very nicely up at our video and that parking that's available after five mm -hmm. in April. So, and keeping that conscious. So that I would say this, you know, generally speaking, it's, it's been a success story on the, on, with the planning board process. I mean, you know, we've, we've been flexible at times, but that's it's very clear that that's a guiding principle. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you start there, and you might enable a little bit, but it's good to have it reinforced so we see the future. Yeah. We did that when we had the workshop down in Dunstan, and we had two groups, and we had maps, and we tried to move it from the, the corridor itself to pathways behind Yeah. Level yeah. paragraph yeah. than it is a local. And 
you know, that we're, we're part of the national discussion. I get it, but <laughs> but what, right. Well, the MS4 idea of going to right. Yep. Angeles. Right. Right. Talking about our our stormwater permits and sort of the regulations that are coming mm -hmm. down in that regard. So yeah, it felt like this was a little bit. You know, so um, I don't know. If others felt the same, but that can certainly so make that comments. Would have had a question on the town's role in the built environment, the green, the green introduction part. The last couple of sentences say many municipalities create partnerships with development community, blah de blah. Um, I have no idea what they're talking about. So if, it, if it's going to be something that we're going to consider, it's going to be a little more in detail than we can. But it does reference type and scale. And the scale of them. As well as in the second sentence. We may have to have a whole yeah, was, yeah, uh, meeting on scale. So. Mm -hmm. Is it literally talking about creating partnerships, or is it more along the lines of what's going on right now with, with the Downs? Downs right. Where right. It's a collaborative, collaborative, multi-plan, yeah. public yeah. master planning process. Right. But the, the, the basic tenets of the zoning are in place. Right now, it's right. Questions: so What do we mean by this? Sort of specifics, or 
you know, it's a topic that's about, I was just saying that today, that we discussed that at the old panel call. I mean, it's been, a, it's been a hot issue, and it always gets smothered. Uh, you know, because right. we can't define what's affordable. Right. Yeah. Stutter home. Yeah, stutter home. There's, right, and there, you know, there's kind of the whole sort of subsidy side of that. And then there's the, what some people might refer to as kind of naturally occurring affordable housing, which can be incentivized through different uh, dimensional and density regulations at times. And, and I'm trying to remember what, as an example, was a few months ago, someone came in front of the planning board of a, you know, it was, in some ways it was an affordable housing. It really was basically just kind of apartments, but, you know, no frill. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's down Dunstan Village, yeah, yeah. Uh, Harold right. Burnham. Right, mm -hmm. yes. right. And, I, and the way he articulated it at the time was, we really, and, and I'm taking that as word, you know, he really wanted, saw this as an unmet need in the town. Obviously, he has an interest, he probably wants to make some money on it too, understandably. But he saw it as an unmet need in the community, and this was a way of providing that without any outside subsidy or any anything sort of. Somebody said he had a picked his brain about all that subsidy. Right. He knew a lot about it. Well, he, so so he doesn't he doesn't do subsidies. That's his. That's, that, that right. was that was sort of his his, his slant on it. Was he he sort of found that sweet spot. Be it, you know, where he's not down at the subsidies level, but he's able to provide housing for those who are making 13 to 14 dollars an hour, and he, you know he's got his pro forma right down, and he, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's the he's size really, of the unit. That's really yeah. So that's down. what I'm, that's what I'm getting yeah. to bring it back to the broader conversation is that, that some of that is a function of size, density, and the things that not, you know people right. might disagree on, but I think that has to be part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. and that's um, what the market has been. And I think as with a lot of this stuff, some of the, that can become an uncomfortable <coughs> conversation because people talk about how we need to have affordable housing, we need to be able to have our teachers and firefighters work live in town, but then if they see a certain type of development going in that's more dense than they think is appropriate or is not. Just the other night, we had people talking about this is not consistent with the character of Scarborough. This is not what Scarborough is about, not to even make the project. But the, that's the kind of thing that I think has to be Address. grappled with. Yeah, it does. And I don't know how to put that into language in the comp plan. I mean, obviously, as a town, we have to deal with this. And when we, when we actually write the comp plan, we have to keep in mind all of this. But this one they provide here is a little more, again, like, it's, it's just too smooth. It doesn't indicate it's not. Yeah. It's not the right way to find the right level of... Mm -hmm. It needs a more up. punch again. It it's acceptable. It needs, to be, well, it needs to be punched up. There is an opportunity with the downs. If the, they mentioned it for 10% you know, requirement for formal housing. Strategy, I think. But I yeah, but we've kind of played with that in the past. I mean, I can remember Carrie yeah. Anderson coming to us, the Chamberlain brothers coming to yeah. us, saying they're dying on the vine no, trying to get affordable housing units into their developments, and they were giving some, you know, there were density bonuses and stuff involved, and they just physically couldn't get people into. Uh, you know, into their developments to make it happen. And it was a matter of some of the, the formulas and, you know. Why what this guy is doing is so important. Yeah, I, it's, I remember having, I, I believe there was a conversation where Tom Hall got involved with the Affordable Housing Alliance and we, you know, we went through a bunch of stuff on what, what can we do, how do we do it to make this work? And, you know, everybody just kind of keeps coming back saying, uh, it doesn't look good. One of the things just um, to 
folks know if you don't already know. Um, with the with the um, uh, what was it being called the Gateway Commons mm -hmm. that, um, at Highest Parkway as part of that contract zone, they paid they were on the hook for seven hundred thousand or some large amount of money for towards affordable housing, and the, the Alliance has put out an RFP to say because I think to date we have about two hundred fifty. It's they're paying sort of yeah. as the buildings come online, so we don't have all the money, but there's an RFP out on the street um, for that said the town's saying, folks, we have we have funding to help with an affordable housing project, and then there's a process to review that, and yeah. um, ultimately the council has to sort of allow those ways to be that's spent. What I'm but, looking for in here is mm -hmm. that the town needs to more publicly take a stand that says the town is going to be involved in creating this kind of and that's exactly, that, that's, that's closer to what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. Has there been a specific strategy in there? Is there any uh, uh, communities out there that have come up with something that yeah. is a workable strategy? Well, I, and I, I guess that's also part of the, what I need to be mindful of with the comprehensive plan. You know, we've already sort of talked about how do we, you know, figure out the environmental issues with it, within our growth areas, the affordable housing. The comp plan is not going to answer every no. question. It needs to highlight that these are the areas we need to work, work on next. That and sort of set the stage. So I think we, we just need to be sure, you know, again, we can take these as far as we want. But if we're going to sort of figure out the answer in the comp plan, we, we're going to never get a comp no, plan. We'll I, just be... I understand. I agree yeah. with you. I like what you just said. And I'm not sure if I can repeat it. But it's like, not sure I could this is what it is we need to really do now in Scarborough. Right. It's, like a it's like a priority setting thing. Yeah. Well, that's what the plan is for. Right? Yeah, the, yeah, these are right. the areas we need to address next. You know, we, we, we got this far based on where we were in the last plan. And kind of rebounding off that, we need to address affordable housing. We need we to, to take it further. We, we haven't gone right. sort of the statement of, right. we have, here are the things, as you just said, Alan, sort of, here are the things we've done. Right. We haven't gone, we still haven't addressed it. Here, look right. at the data. We haven't addressed it. We need to go further. Rather than waiting until we get to, yeah. I mean, we look again yeah. in more detail when we get right. to this kind of thing. Well, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Or a commitment yeah. statement yeah. of some sort. The 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 pick the implementation works on that. I do like the fact that it does talk, it does right. reference. Right. 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 I was on the implementation committee and I was on these. But we need to know what they were including. I think that would make me ever so much more comfortable. I don't know. I'm a little confused about accessory dwelling units on page 12. Township is four ways to create more diversity, allowing residents to stay in the same area. Accessory quality units are available to provide smaller, more affordable housing conditions within single family or mixed use neighborhoods. Um, I'm not sure how to put this in a comp plan, but we allow for ADUs but limit the number of occupants to two and then you can. 750 square feet. I mean, is this the place where that belongs? I mean, maybe it doesn't need to be that prescriptive. I think what they're, I think what they're just saying, I think they're just identifying what we already allow. So again, back to what we were talking about, what what the town's already doing here. I think there's, they're, they're starting to highlight some of the things the town does that leans towards affordable housing, and I think they're then saying we could step up beyond what we're already okay. doing. Um, like four occupants. Right, or not worry about the number of occupants or what have you. Or, so, well, it becomes a density issue. The last yeah, sentence, this last sentence makes sense. The town is finished because it created restrictions on the number of occupants that correspond to the square footage. Yeah, it's good water. Right, yeah. So, I think yeah. yeah. I don't know if that's all I did. But yeah, I think that's what these sort of last six or seven bullet points under affordable housing affordability are aimed at doing. Yeah. Sort of what we were talking about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bottom line is it just hasn't been much commitment. Okay. Well, 
some of it comes from the extent that we created a work on it and we couldn't. So we've given people the easy way out at this point. But pay for it. Either. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that fee could be increased, right? Could be. You know, I'm not trying to make it restricted, but you're trying to also say, hey, look, it's got to be more than just lip service. We have, we've got to really do something. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm looking for. So, you know, my partner over here says, and then you turn it over to the implementation committee. <laughs> <laughs> the implementation committee is going to want to know how far it can go. And if this, if this document says, go for it, then the implementation committee is going to like when this committee or the council says, oh, I'm portal. Yeah, right. <laughs> And as we all know, it always becomes a balance, right? You, know, you can have all the ideas around this table, but then there's a whole community discussion that occurs, and there's a host of host of uh, thoughts on every issue, and so, well, this trying to find idea. the yeah, compromises. Is this, posted, is this posted on the website? Uh, so it went on. Um, it, it was attached as part of our yeah. agenda, and so it'll get put up so online. I yeah. wanted to have committees sort of. Well, they come back to us with. Our suggestions for so what, what what they're going to do is sort of take what we're doing, and so I think the next time we're going to see all this is as a full package. The previous one that they did and yep. this one, right? So sort of more that are coming, right? Right. Yep. So actually, I just received late this afternoon an email from Sandrine that had two more chapters. So I'll be sending those around here shortly. So okay. there's. So yeah, I don't think we're going to get. You're not, we're not going to get this chapter back just like this. I think we'll, we'll see it integrated. We'll see it with the pictures. So we'll see it. So we're taking minutes that are going to capture sort of our concerns, and so we'll be able to sort of go back and so either hold hold on to your draft, which is not a bad idea to do with your notes. But we can also once we do get the full draft, we can go back into our minutes and say okay. Talked about, you know, as a reminder of what we talked about, right. but I am um, essentially what I what I'm doing with each of these is I'm sending back to Sandrine sort of a list yeah. of comments. Some of them are you know just typo stuff, but a lot of it is sort of the a you know um, sort of policy level stuff that we're talking about here. So uh, that's why I was trying to bring up some of the thoughts I had to be sure I'm capturing it right as we're sending these thoughts along and, and then adding what you folks have to say as well. So. Overall, so I think they're doing a good job. I, mean, I, I don't have any huge negative things to say about what they're doing. It's just the, the areas where they just kind of... Well, I see big ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so one of the comments Jay made, I mean, I think, and, and Karen maybe as well, is that there, I think there's going to be a certain amount of recitation in there because the, you do have to... You have to meet the statutory requirements for right. the comp plan. So you've got you to check all those boxes. Uh, and there are also going to be things that are sort of repeating or, or reinforcing what was in the old plan, which is appropriate too. Uh, but I agree that there are areas where it can be flushed out. I think the idea of this is what we did. What the previous plan said, this is what we did, and this is what we want to do. And that, this is written in such ways that you know that you can pull the ideas out that you can put on the timeline, so that you know again we address them full fledged again yep. um, and uh, talk about the issue. Yeah. Anything else? Public comment? Any public comment? Public question? Sure. Um, what's the timeline for this <laughs> in terms of? Uh, turning around a more or less full draft and making it available to the public, and how's that going to happen? Um, so let's see, hopefully we'll see the full draft in the next, I'm not, I guess I'm, I'm not entirely certain when we'll see the full draft, but in the next month or two. Um, and then we'll have to talk about as a committee sort of how, what the process is once we have that from the, from the consultant. I think we have talked about in the past, you know, doing um, sort of a roadshow with it, I would envision, but again, I think as a committee, we'll, we'll want to talk about how we roll it out, how we be sure, how to ensure that we get enough public 
comment and feedbacks and that the community has. That's the other thing. This is a hefty document. It's a big document. The community is going to need time to soak with it, think about it, read it, and have um, time to sort of deliberate. So um, I don't think it's going to be a quick, hey, we got the draft. Council, here you go. We're, it's all good. I think there's going to be quite a bit of discussion. But again, um, we'll have to talk about that with the committee. So hopefully that helps answer some of your questions. It will go Oh, oh, we want it adopted by fall. I mean, late fall. Or, aren't, isn't that our goal? I, it's if a lot of goal. Right. We can make that happen. Yep. Yeah. 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 I, I guess I, 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 I sense of it is eight more than half. But it's a matter of. It's very large. Well, what is our requirement as far as the state's concerned? Uh, you know, uh, there's. I'm not really too concerned with the state requirements. That okay. the, we, they're not going to fine us. We're not under any violation. We're working on it. So it's not as though, I guess there's very, that's that's the least of my concerns. Let okay. me put it that way. Our state, you know, they're, they're, at this point, the state review, and I think we talked about this before, the state review 10, 12 years ago when we adopted this, they had, we had a state planning office that had a dozen people in it. Everyone looked at it. It got sent to every agency. We got, in this, not just Scarborough, but every town, got tons of comments. At this point, there's one guy who basically says, have you guys checked the box? Yep. Okay, this plan looks good. It's, it's a much different state level okay. process. So I'm, I'm very much less concerned about the state level than okay. I am. What we actually did. What, what we have. What the yep. community so we're not, yeah, we're not operating under any kind of arbitrary. We're under no gun. And, and the state knows we're working on this. You know, Phil um, yep. up at the state knows that we're, we're doing this process. And so we're, we're definitely keeping them in the loop. So, yeah, I don't think we're under any type of hammer at all. Okay. Okay. Wow. That was a public comment, right? All right. Very good. Our next meeting is a month from tonight. Yeah. That's right. We've established sort of doing comp plan meetings. The, was this the fourth Thursday? Fourth Thursday. Yeah. Yep. And yep. then we're our standing long range planning the is, the, is the first Friday, Friday. Friday of the month. Okay. So, so next yeah. Friday. Yeah. Um, so we're back uh, here. Next, yes. uh, oh. uh, next Friday. Yep. Okay, we're back here. Uh, I can't go. Next Friday morning is here. Yep. And all meetings in the evening are here in this building. Okay, thank you. Except for the planning board. All long range planning. Yeah, that's sure. Okay. Fourth so Thursday of the month. Yeah. Our conference related Friday Thursday night meetings are all here. Yeah. yeah. And so we'll, we'll talk about what an agenda might look like for next Friday.